Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is celiac disease. This is a short video that will be focusing on a complicated pathophysiology, the pathophysiology and clinical pathologic findings of celiac disease. So celiac disease, also known as celiac sprue and gluten-sensitive enteropathy, arises in genetically susceptible individuals who develop then an immune-mediated enteropathy. More than 99% of people with celiac disease have HLA-DQ2 and or HLA-DQ8 MHC class 2 uh, molecules. Now this may seem like a great way to start screening, but about 30 to 40 percent of the general population also have these class 2 molecules. When these individuals ingest gluten, they get an immune-mediated enteropathy. Gluten is found in wheat, barley, and rye, and it's important to recognize that this is a relatively recent addition to the human diet if you think about the evolution of the human species. And we're not really designed to uh, adequately digest this particular protein. This results in large peptides that uh, can be quite immunogenic. As with other autoimmune disorders, uh, celiac disease is associated with additional autoimmune diseases, so type 1 diabetes, autoimmune thyroid disease, and Sjogren's syndrome. And the treatment, though straightforward, can be uh, somewhat onerous. It is a very strict gluten-free diet. So how do these patients present? So in pediatric patients, the classic presentation will be uh, children who are about 6 to 24 months old, which is at the time that gluten is typically introduced into an infant's diet. Uh, children will then present perhaps with irritability, uh, failure to thrive, uh, so weight loss, abdominal distension, uh, anorexia, diarrhea, uh, muscle wasting. In older uh, patients, you can get these similar uh, GI symptoms, uh, but also because of the malnutrition, you can get delayed puberty, uh, short stature, and then there are extra gastrointestinal uh, symptoms like arthritis and joint pain. There is a subset of people who are not diagnosed with celiac disease until adulthood, typically in the range of 30 to 60 years. They may present with anemia uh, because of uh, mucosal ulceration and, and blood loss, uh, diarrhea, bloating, fatigue, and vitamin malabsorption uh, as we lose our, our villi. Or they may be completely asymptomatic. And as I discussed in the inflammatory bullous diseases uh, video, about 10% of patients can get dermatitis herpetiformis. The pathophysiology of a celiac disease is quite complicated, uh, although we have a great deal of understanding on it. Don't be afraid of this wall of text. I'm going to show you a figure that's going to nicely uh, bring this all together for you. So as I mentioned, uh, for these individuals, they eat gluten. Uh, we digest that down to a gliadin peptide, which is about 33 amino acids, and there are various portions of it that have increased immunogenicity. Uh, in, the, uh, in the gut, Tissue transglutaminase will respond to these uh, peptides by deamidating the gliadin. What this does is it increases the negative charge on this peptide, increasing binding to HLA-DR2 and HLA-DQ8 class 2 molecules uh, on those uh, antigen-presenting cells in the lamina propria. So the antigen-presenting cells will grab onto that gliadin, present it to uh, CD4 positive T cells and activate them. The activated CD4 positive T cells will generate cytokines such as interferon gamma that can cause tissue damage. Now we have this inflammatory milieu and in such a, a background you can get the uh, exposure of previously hidden or typically hidden epitopes, and we develop antibodies to tissue transglutaminase, deamidated gli uh, gliadin, and endomysium, endomysium being that thin sheath uh, around muscle bundles. We also know that tissue transglutaminase can covalently cross-link to gliadin, forming neoantigens, so this may also drive the formation of autoantibodies. Gliadin itself is irritating to the uh, intestinal epithelium and will provoke epithelial cells to secrete IL-15. IL-15 is going to cause the activation and proliferation of CD8 positive T cells, and they're going to migrate into the uh, epithelium. Uh, this is referred to as intraepithelial lymphocytosis, and they express a protein called NKG2D, which can bind to a protein called MYC-A. MYC-A is an enterocyte stress response protein. So you have your, uh, your epithelium of the mucosa, which is stressed and irritated by this inflammation. T cells are going to recognize that, see it as stressed, and attack that cell, leading to mucosal damage. 
as we get increased mucosal damage, it's easier for these large peptides to cross the epithelium and regenerate the cycle in the lamina propria. So let's take it a figure, look at a figure that's going to bring this together in a really nice way. This comes from the 11th edition of Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology. So here you can see gluten has been uh, consumed. It is digested as far as possible by our GI tract uh, into gliadin. The largest load of gliadin is going to be in the duodenum uh, because that's where it's, it's first generated. It's going to cross the epithelium where tissue transglutaminase is going to deaminate it. And as I mentioned, this deaminated gliadin is going to induce our epithelial cells to produce IL-15. IL-15 is going to stimulate uh, these CD8 positive T cells, which are expressing NKGT2D, which will bind to MCA on these unhappy stressed uh, enterocytes and then start killing them. The deaminated gliadin, remember, uh, increased negative charge, very avid for HLA-DQ2 or DQ8 on our antigen-presenting cells, presented here to a happy CD4 positive T cell, uh, which will then uh, release interferon gamma and other cytokines, causing tissue damage in the area, but can also further differentiate uh, to form plasma cells, forming these autoantibodies that I mentioned before, uh, anti-gliadin, not an an autoantibody, but anti-endomysium and anti-TTG. So the net effect of these uh, various insults is going to take the happy, healthy uh, duodenal mucosa here with nice long villi, uh, short crypts, occasional uh, intraepithelial lymphocytes, to villus atrophy, which can uh, initially present as villus blunting, so a little bit shorter, a little bit shorter, and then flat out atrophy when there's nothing and it looks just like the top of the colon. We also will see this increased intraepithelial lymphocytosis, so uh, these uh, lymphocytes here in the epithelium, and elongation uh, of the crypt. And with all of the uh, inflammatory cytokines and, and growth factors around, we're going to see increased mitosis. So before we take a look at what this looks like histologically, let's take a step back and think about how we make this diagnosis, because I think it goes nicely when we think about the pathogenesis. So if you have a patient who is presenting with symptoms suggestive of Crohn's disease, your first step is not going to be small intestinal biopsy. Your first step is going to do serologic testing. And the first line test for that will be looking at IgA antibodies to tissue transglutaminase. This is our most sensitive assay. Uh, and as you'll recall, Ig antibodies, uh, IgA antibodies are the ones that are um, put forth on the mucosa. So they are going to uh, be strongest in the setting. Uh, a second line test will be IgA antibodies to endomysium. Now keep in mind that about 2% of patients with celiac disease are IgA deficient. Uh, so say you run these two tests, the patient is really looking like they might have celiac disease. We have assays for IgG antibodies to tissue transglutaminase and to deaminated gliadin. So that can be useful in that context. Now, if you have an off-the-chart positive response using serologic tests and you have classic symptoms, it may not be necessary to put your patient through uh, the experience of a small intestinal biopsy. However, most of the time, the small intestinal biopsy is necessary for correct diagnosis. And what we will do is, uh, is uh, the endoscopist will biopsy the second portion of the duodenum, uh, proximal jejunum, and what we will see on the glass slide will be villus atrophy, uh, intraepithelial uh, C8 positive T cells, so that intraepithelial lymphocytosis and crypt hyperplasia. So let's look at a really um, just flagrant example of celiac disease. This to me looks almost like colon. Uh, there are no villi. Uh, we have a compare and contrast here with a normal duodenal uh, mucosa or no, normal small intestinal mucosa here where we see our uh, nice long villi. Uh, really don't see uh, very many uh, intraepithelial uh, lymphocytes. I'll show you a higher power of celiac disease in a moment. And notice these short crypts, right? Here, by contrast, uh, these are very long crypts and no villi. So this is a classic appearance of severe celiac disease. And if we look on higher magnification just at the surface, you can see here this little dark cell. Here's another nucleus, here's more, here's more. There are a couple more here. There are lots, actually, of uh, T lymphocytes here in this epithelium. There's some here. Uh, contrast that with a more um, cigar-shaped and somewhat lighter uh, nuclei of the, uh, of the epithelium. So as I mentioned, the treatment for this will be a gluten-free diet. Uh, but 
in a certain uh, subset of patients, they will become refractory to a gluten-free diet, and they will present again with symptoms of you know, abdominal pain, etc. But something you need to be aware of, say you've got your patient, you've got your diagnosis of celiac disease, you've got them on their gluten-free diet, they're very adherent to that. There are a couple of other things you need to be aware of. It's not like they're now on autopilot. If that patient then presents with abdominal pain, diarrhea, or weight loss, it could be that it's, they've become refractory to the gluten-free diet, but there's also the possibility that they have developed a malignancy because there are two malignancies that are increased in incidence in individuals with celiac disease. The first of these to consider is an enteropathy-associated T-cell lymphoma. This is similar to what we see in Helicobacter pylori gastritis-associated mucosa-associated lymphoid uh, tumors. So you have this, uh, this really constant inflammation if it's not well controlled. You have this, uh, originally uh, you have uh, a very uh, polymorphic uh, uh, group of, uh, of T cells, this T cell population, uh, but then you can get a clone that emerges that uh, is neoplastic. Uh, and this enteropathy associated T cell lymphoma is quite aggressive. Another uh, malignancy that can develop in celiac disease is a small intestinal uh, adenocarcinoma. Again, similar to what we see in H. pylori associated gastritis, because in those individuals too, this cycle of uh, injury regeneration, injury regeneration offers that opportunity for a mutation to occur. And so these individuals can present, as I mentioned, with abdominal pain, uh, diarrhea, or weight loss, uh, even if they're on a strict gluten-free diet, so you should consider malignancy. I want to show you what this very rare entity of enteropathy-associated T-cell lymphoma looks like. Here's a low-power view where we can see our uh, small intestinal crypts, but the most prominent finding, of course, are these sheets of small round cells that are just uh, blowing through uh, the, uh, the mucosa and the lamina propria. Here on higher magnification, you can see these atypical small round cells uh, that are just uh, uh, really just evenly dispersed uh, and invasive through uh, this, uh, this tissue. Uh, and then uh, one of the things that we can do to confirm that these are T cells is to do an immunohistochemical stain for CD3. And you can see here that these cells are definitely T cells. And that's very unusual to have sheets of T cells uh, in uh, the intestinal mucosa. So I'd like to finish with a few questions. So one is, which cells cause the mucosal damage in celiac disease? How do you diagnose celiac disease? And how does a gluten-free diet improve this condition? And then something else really to cons uh, consider is what are some of the, uh, the risk, uh, what, what are some of the complications of celiac disease uh, that we just discussed regarding malignancy? Uh, I hope you found this uh, helpful. Uh, please uh, feel free to uh, comment, uh, send me uh, uh, an email, or follow me on Twitter.